uh, maybe we can start off with the basic, you know, background understanding of when did you first start collecting? What compelled you to slowly build up and acquire this collection? How, how it all started is probably in the mid 1990s, about 95, 96, I was seriously into photography in, as a hobby. Then uh, because of my traveling, then I came across some black and white studio images, small ones at the flea market. This is where MCOP Mall started about that time. And straight away, it strikes me back to when I was a, a toddler. My dad was a photographer and uh, probably at the age of about four or so. And this, this image of a lady with a honeycomb, you know, kind of a hairstyle with the long white glove with a pose and kind of thing. It, it struck me because uh, in, in the dark room, uh, and uh, my dad used to pull me into a dark room so that I, I don't go out and be mischievous. So that, that image stuck on me. And I came across this image at the flea market and it struck me back. I said, wow, sort of like connect me back. I bought that image and then I started to see more and more. And I started to collect by his studio ones, all on the ladies, you not know, just ladies and in whatever style, the kind of thing, you know. So I, I just collect random. As I collect, it appeared to me a lot more of this portrait studios, in particularly studios. Not so much of the casual ones on the street or kind of thing. I mean, it connects me, you know, but still the studios one. So I started to buy and, and, and it went on it and be over the years at MCOP Mall. I traveled to Penang and the Malacca, almost every flea market. And I became so attracted to it that I must go and search. And I walked into an antique shop. I would ask, do you have old photographs? I just kept collecting anyway. So that's how we started. That's how we accumulated over years. And, um, and a lot more of these old photos, I can see the older ones in the 1920s, 30s starts to emerge, you know, and I started buying them. I began to look beyond just the lady in, in the, the, the style, you know, because I, looked, I was curious about the style of it. I was curious, curious of uh, the photographer, whoever the serial photographer that was behind all this, and the people, the subject, the people that were posing as an individual or family or kids. And I, I was just curious. I mean, I was just thinking like, I know they, they're all dressed up for the day. Is that the real of them? Who decides? Was it the photographer who decides how they should pose? Or is it themselves? So I began to read a bit more, more research, and I, I was just curious about it. So it became passion of it. So I think that's where the um, the collection came in for black and white. Then came out the hand coloring ones, and the hand coloring was amazing because as a kid I used to watch my dad used to do some hand coloring and retouching, you know, on the negative and the photos. So it struck me again. So then I began to collect and coloring ones. So that is how you can see the collection has grew over the years from the mid 1990s to now. I think I have close to probably 3,000 or more. This kind of thing. So that's, yeah, yeah, just, just the studio, it's portraits. And I think the thing is that I don't think portraits are photographer. I think in Azriel know my works is always do with study landscape in black and white. I can print my own stuff kind of thing. But I'm interested in portrait faces. So the curious thing is these people who pose in front of the studio. I always think that that's not real. That's not them. It's like a, they're wearing a mask, you know, kind of thing over them. Like they're doing it just for a day, whether it's a wedding or a family portrait kind of thing. So I began to look deeper into it. I get a lot more Chinese portraits because, you know, different age as, they, they, as a newborn baby after a month then the first year and the birthday. Um, I have trouble getting Malays because Malay portraits are not many because culturally they don't take a lot of photos and they, they don't hang, uh, you know, yeah, the ancestors or whatever. They don't so much on anybody's date. I, I think Azri would know that, that they, you don't put uh, whereas the Chinese, you can see, I got plenty of them. Uh, I get a bit of Indians as well. The collection grew, I think, you know, from north to south. 
to Batu Pahat or to Lima ke, to Sabah, I travel and all that. So basically it's how I think the, the whole thing started, yeah. You connected this to a childhood memory of your father having once run a sort of photo studio. Can you tell us more about it? Where was this photo studio? What do you recall specifically about the photo studio and whether there were any experiences that you find particularly meaningful? The studio where it started, I think, Expo was uh, in Rao. It's called Mighty Studio. With the young toddler, I remember before school, I'm always in the So my dad would always pull me in the dark room, do simple things like change the water when he prints it. Uh, you, you need to get the water to be changed, print, and then those days, um, print need to be dried. You put it into this dryer, then I got to watch it. I got to change it and then dispose of his rubbish from all the dark room, whatever chemicals and things. I think that grew into me, but I, I learned nothing from my dad. My dad never taught me anything about it. He just said, go, go to school, you know, come back from school, you finish your homework, come to the dark room, help me do all those minor, minor things. The studio, remember, was on the... Topmost floor, Saturday, Sundays is, I'll sit by the windows because I control the light coming in from the window. Uh, and there was no air con, it's just a stand fan. And my dad would be using the old wooden studio. Then he would just signal, then I'll let him the light. Then he, he flipped his hand and I'll just sit there the whole day, you know, literally just <laughs> letting in the light, you know, the air as well. So I think I grew up into that. Yeah, basically very much into dark room. Uh, doing all the chores, like basically all the dirty work as a kind of thing. Then I think my dad decided to retire quite early. I was in my teenage years because he, he decided to go into farming in Rao. I don't think he passed on anything to me. Yeah, other than the photos I managed to count, kind of not so much of the cameras. Thing. Those, those days in the 50s, life was tough, you know. Is this a family business? Yeah, it was a family business. Just my dad, my mom, and me being the eldest, so I help around a lot. What about your uh, grandfather? I think my dad was an apprentice, he told me. He came from China anyway. He was born in China. He probably about 1910, 1900, they, they came over by boats. I remember him telling me with my grandmother. And he came to Sungai Basi first. He landed in KL. Some or other, I don't know why, he, he moved to Rao because to, I think, to hike, to, to be safer from away from the city with all the rumor about Japanese invasion. I remember he started his as a apprentice at this studio where he took over. Yeah, he started uh, learning from this old guy. He used to tell me he would have to boil water, clean every whole place. That's how he grew up uh, learning. So I think the guy died uh, and then he took over the business or bought over the business to or two of his close friends. But eventually he ran the whole business. I married my mom. That's how it started. Yeah. You have a question. So, so it was by chance that your father took over the business. It's not that he was all the while was fascinated by photography. So it's kind of like a half chance. And then he was also interested in, in visual culture. Yeah, that's right. So the first owner, I think he died. I remember was a very old man. He died. And my dad was the, the key person, yeah, the, the assistant. So he took over the business. The Mighty Studio uh, is in Mandarin. It's called Meita, you know. I think you understand Mighty Studio Meita because I remember it was a half traditional medicine shop called San Chao, you know. And then the studio was half Mighty Studio. It's San Chao. It sells all the herbs. That was his first job in my birth cert when I was born. Uh, his profession was written as a photographer. On you and on my birth right. cert. So th is he aware that you've been? collecting obsessively. Do you share with him? Was he pleased that you are doing that and you guys do have something to talk about? Or... When he found out that I was interested in photography and I was working, you know, with, with Nikon, he was, yeah. was a bit like, what say he's unhappy or was a bit like upset? I said, why? <laughs> why are you working for a Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> Because oh, he's really nationalist. Oh, wow. Wow. He said, why are you working for a Japanese? <laughs> and yeah. then the other one, he said, why are you going to photography? I thought you have a job. Oh, that I was in a totally different line. I was in the sports management. Kind of. But he was getting more upset about me working for Nikon, the Japanese company. He hasn't right. got this good impression about Japanese at all. Zero. But and all was the saying, lenses are designed by Japanese these days. All the camera lenses. <laughs> 
Yeah. What kind of camera was he using back then? Oh, I remember the studio is probably, I don't know whether it's a seagull exactly that uh, Azrael has, I might have. I remember I will play with it, you know, the big bulky camera, the huge one. Uh -huh. There was the camera or that it was just film. I remember because he does a lot of studio and then he uses the speed graphic. That when that you go down, he go down to my school, he takes uh, all the class photos. This is speed graphic, yeah. So he has got basically two, and then he has the Rolly fly something or seagull with the twin, twin lens, yeah. So I remember mm -hmm. seeing this, basically he uses these three cameras yeah, a lot. I think you mentioned before that he closed the business around the 1970s, right? Since he closed his business, do you guys ever talk about photography? Does he have any view of photography? No, 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 not a, he, he hasn't got a very good view of photography. Right. And uh, he, he find out more to my friends that I was into photography. Because my dad is a very strict kind of thing, very... He said, hey, you know, he'll say things like, oh, this for playing, you know, how, how can you like earn, earn a living? You know, that, uh, you know, there's so much of work you can do. Why, why are you working for a Japanese guy and going back to photography? He has a very good impression of photography. I don't know why. It's just... What did you eventually study after high school? I went to FIT, Federal Institute of Technology. I did uh, engineering for three years. I got a job in a bank, you know, believe it or not. I ended up with a bank from bank. I went to sports for many, many years. Then I came back to a photography because I was interested in photography. I started as a hobby, ended up working with an imaging company. And I, I just love it. Before I joined Nikon, year 2000 or about 90, I started Silver Gelatin. Okay. Two other friends, yeah. Uh, I think that's where I first met Azriel as well. When he came by, I was in SS2. It was black and white studio. It was more like a hobby kind of thing. Then during the time, I left my sports job because I was bored with it. I wanted to do something different. And I was guest curator for Balai Sani Lokis. Then I was doing a lot of things with Japan Culture Foundation, Alas Fonse, and then the US Embassy. You know, the kind of thing I was doing that, I was traveling quite a bit. Yeah, I was getting a, quite a bit of grant. That's where I, I did some exhibitions as well. The year between 2000 to 2009, I was actively more into exhibition and a bit of teaching and uh, you know, doing a bit of wearable photography related and I was still collecting bit and bit kind of thing. So can you tell us a bit more about Silver Gelatin? Like what is it exactly? Mm. Who's in it and what was the objective? I was actively already into photography. I was a president of PSPJ. For 97 to year 1999, for three yes, terms. Yes, the Malaysian Photography Society. Correct. I, I, that's where I met um, Eric Perrys and the late Ismail Hashim. Uh, we were all together, five of us actually. Eric. Eric was a silent partner. He, the late Ismail Hashim was a silent partner. Myself, uh, Hock Singh, and Herman. Fu. So we were all into it. And then Soraya came in after thing. The rest of them. So we had a group called. Uh, friends of Silver Gelatin, we were just doing black and white, we, we did exhibitions every now and then. So we, we sold a lot of prints and kind of, so it went on good, and I was teaching as well, that time was still analog. So good three years, it was hard work. Then during that period of time, suddenly Nikon offered me a job uh, because they need someone to run workshops, to run around. Since I'm, a, I'm good at organizing things like that. Uh, so that's when uh, 2009 they offered me to do a full time with Nikon. You mentioned that Silver Gelatin has a space in SS2. What kind of space was it? Was it a gallery or was it a studio or was it just was it a clubhouse? It was a classroom. We had a library and then we have a, a studio. We had a dark room. Self-contained very much is just one floor on the topmost floor. It's like a very laid back or just come in and uh, you know, you want to have uh, learn about photography, about cameras, how the camera works. And uh, But for us, the whole group were more about black and white. Okay. So you can say it's like a half hobby, half serious kind of thing. Yeah. Was it a non-profit model? People buy prints. I mean, we have collectors and I think, you know, that's where once in a while we had at the time the gallery were were supportive were Valentine Willie, Taksu, NN Gallery, 
you know, these are three big gallery uh, that they were into photography. But we did a lot more exhibition. I will go to the page one, then we'll go to Bangsa Shopping Center, you know, Bangsa, as it is. I must say Bangsa was still the best place, the shopping mall. People, people are a lot more, I think the foreigners there, they're a lot more supportive of photography. So we, we saw quite a lot of work. Then we have a lot more other senior photographers joining us as well. So it's more like you say, it's, it's not, not a money-making thing. Nothing. Right. During this time, you were already collecting. Like, okay. Yeah, I was really collecting very much into MCOP. It was cheap, you know. Postcard size or the studio postcard, 4R. It's just two, three ringgit, the kind of thing. So I will uh, collect. And then it, it started to get more and more expensive. Yeah, that's how it is. It was just few ringgit. Now for the same thing, then they'll try to ask me for 30 ringgit. Now you go, or 15 ringgit, depend. Depend on the subject and depend on the, the period the photos are taken. But I think it, over the years, uh, most of these runners uh, were MCOT or blown uh, kool in Penang to all this flea market down there. Some day they, they, they know me because even Ipoh, they were, oh, there's only one one idiot who collects dead people for you know, all these dead people, uncle and people's kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. But there are a few people who collect as well. But I think, I'm sure there are other people who are, there are collectors, silent collectors that I don't know uh, of, but I'm not sure how, how into it. You know. How do you know how the runner system works? I became friends with a lot of these runners. The, the source of the photos interestingly comes from two or three sources. One is, this, these photos were actually chucked away, discarded. These young, they say, you know, this, and when their parents are dead or uncle, they, they move, when they start moving, houses, they were just chucked uh, out. So these people go and pick, uh, pick them up, that's one source of it. Majority of them actually are discarded, you know, they just threw uh, away. Uh, okay. And then a lot of people, these runners say they move, and I think typically in Penang, especially in Penang, when they move houses, they, they, they will call these people with, oh, come back uh, to my home, whatever rubbish it is, you take. Only lately, I found there are one or two collectors that, like that Iban series, yeah, the Nukes one. If I'm not wrong, it's from a collector from USB Kuching. But other than that, I think most of these photos were actually discarded. Majority of them, a lot of the runners are telling me, they find it difficult to find these photos which I, I want. I say, why? Because they say, those who have moved already moved one generation, yeah? When yeah. they have moved, they have thrown everything. You have moved one location, whatever they, you don't you are really probably burned or discarded. So it's getting less and less. And of course, more the older ones uh, are difficult. And they say, and a lot of people tend to know the price. So even they don't want the young people say they'll say, Oh, I want to sell this. No, it's my grand auntie or grand uncle, some old dead people, disease photos. You want you know, you want you know, give me some money. So what's your selection criteria when, when you are presented with all these photos? I mean, how do you choose what to buy? I must say when I started I, I picked up a lot of rubbish because you're so hungry, you just buy, buy, buy. And over time, then you begin to realize the make of the photo, the time, the period, uh, you know, the... Normally, I'll just browse through the photo and whatever that strikes me, it's, it's, you know, I, I will just take it. Very common ones, I would not take it. Kind of, but in most cases, all these runners, they have a whole bunch of it, right? The whole plastic bag. You take everything, you don't choose. Just pay me X amount of dollars, you take it. Then I run through, I say, like, there are probably like 10, 20 good ones. The others are all bad ones. Ah, no, 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 no. You want you take all. I got no time for it. So I ended up buying the whole lot. That's why, you know, you will find some of them are actually not so good. Anyway, it's part of it. What's the most expensive one you've spent on any of the individual prints? And do you set a cap to how much you spend in buying? I try to, to be honest, to set a cap, but there's something difficult. I think the most expensive one I paid is 1,200 ringgit. That piece that uh, Simon, that one guy who, with the um, piton, I think that piece, that is probably the most expensive piece I paid with some Chinese lettering. I think you know which piece I'm right. talking about. 
Uh, the other pieces that came were pretty reasonable within, uh, they were taken in the 1920s, 30s, very nice, but that piece was most expensive. Frankly, I don't know why, because the runner say he paid a lot of money from this piece because it be actually belonged to somebody. And it was at the M Corp Mall, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think probably the Rose Chan series was expensive, you know. So when we were going through your photographs, what a lot of us noticed is how much care you take, you put into wrapping them up, making sure that they're covered in acid-free paper, giving proper care. The conservation of the photograph, was this a gradual process in which you learned how to conserve or did you initially already have a plan or a design? When I started collecting, I think over the time, uh, it was piled up into those boxes. Then I realized, look, I need to conserve a key bit, a bit. So I did a bit of research. I think I, did, I, I remember I asked Azrael Zolo kind of thing. <laughs> so I ended up getting this tracing paper, you know, the paper that you, I thought that were the best and it's cheap and okay. still reasonable. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I, I tried to properly get it all wrapped and preserved. Then I use gel, you know, those, those uh, uh, silica gel. Silica gel, yeah, to keep it dry. So in some ways, when you were curating the show for Balai with Lian Chong, uh, and then subsequently the following year you did a Biennale, during that period, you it was still at the beginning phase of your collection. You didn't have this extensive of a collection. When I did the book with Lian, that I was already collecting. Uh, not this <laughs> In that book, you don't see my name on it because I put my wife's name. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because... To be honest, I think there was, I just don't want to expose too much. Secondly is, I wasn't ready to, sh to share with anyone, to be honest. What was the turning point for you? When did you decide that maybe it's time to <laughs> give the photographs a bit of a public presence? To be honest with you, if Azriel don't keep harping on it, nah. it's I think years. I <laughs> know, That's okay, a long time begging, I heard. <laughs> Two or three reasons. Number one, I haven't got enough. Okay. Because I always tell myself, well, if I want to show something, make sure I have the very best. Mm -hmm. And I always ask this question, and I think Azriel has said, look, you can't collect everything. You might have all the money. You, you will never able to, you've got to stop something. You can keep collecting. You know, it's kind of a point of time. So this has been going on like two, three years. Every now and then, Azrael will poke me, hey, you can't call it. I, I just tell myself, there's still some better pieces. I haven't got it, and it's not complete yet. I still need to go on to find, search, and find, find them when I'm ready, and then probably a time that I, I will do it. So I think it's just most recently, to, to be honest, I got a bit fed up with Azrael. I said, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, do it, get it done. I, I, get it done, yeah, get it done, yeah. If we come back to you, Alex, maybe Q as well. <laughs> How do you come into the story? Alex, I mentioned, my, when I first knew him over at Silver Gelatin Studio, it was roughly about 2002. Uh, the initial idea was uh, because I knew Alex and, and his team, and his sort of uh, brethren brothers of the Silver Gelatin group. They're probably the only group that I know uh, of that do black and white because I just recently came back from the US and uh, I have an affinity to do black and white imaging. And coming back to Malaysia is almost like a forced situation because when I was in the States, I was working in a lab, in a studio with photographers as an assistant photographer and September 11 had to happen. So that's where they just pull out my uh, my green card and all that and I had to come back to Malaysia and I have all the skills and I just don't know where to place it in Malaysia and probably what my thought was maybe Alex and Soraya Talismail at Paris and so forth probably they have the answer to, to see where all of this fit in. So from there on I think Alex knew me and he knew that I do black and white and every now and then that uh, Alex invited me to do the exhibition he had mentioned all the way up to 2009 until he actively joined Nikon. Uh, but about 2010, that's when I left for the UK. Then I was, in, I think I get in touch with Alex like randomly. I think once in every year or two, see him over at his workplace over at Nikon Center over at Bajaya Times Square. That's where I 
so like like CBV, CARTVZ, that with Alex, and I think uh, Alex had began to extensively um, share with me his images, I think, through Facebook and through sharing session with me uh, until I come back from the UK in 2015 or 16. And that's where we sat down and actually uh, more on a serious talk in, to see how accumulatively his collection is, has a certain, I, I suppose, like a benchmark. A benchmark in a sense where it makes sense collectively. I mean, like uh, me and him, we travel a lot. We travel from state to state, pick up images in between. And I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, in any opportunity that I pick up on any old photo studio, particularly old photo studios, I'll pass it to Alex because it doesn't make sense to be in my care. I mean, I have like uh, slides, I have random. I mean, like individually, they are interesting, but it ends there. The, uh, the interest just like ends, oh, it's a nice image, it's a nice characteristic and all that. And then uh, I say, this belongs to Alex's collection. I always like believe in that and, and I just pass it to him. Time I pass, I like to ask him how much. He say I don't care. <laughs> it does not matter. I mean, yeah, because literally, um, it has to be there because his collection. I mean, like the bigger it gets, to it, it makes more sense. I, I suppose cultural sense as well, because stuff like this is going and going and gone. Photo studios that me and Alex had witnessed over the year changed. The landscape of photo studio is already hit the nail in the coffin when the government took over the job of taking photo images of passport images, I think when it's being done over at the offices of the DJ or the custom office, the immigration office and so forth, that's it. I mean, photo studio is going to be gone from the landscape of our trading business. So that's why it's like uh, randomly you see like old photo studios, they are no longer photo studios, they are other businesses. Some of it is what, uh, Jual Ikan Lager, right? Alex? Yep. Uh, Joel Ikan Lager, all the random things, all everything but photography studio. So it move on. I mean, like, uh, they are interested, interesting characters we meet. Majority of them are second or, or third generation of photo studio owners, which they already have lost interest in taking care of the, the, the facilities, the images, the slides, the negatives. They just toss it out. Some of it is because of environmental damage of uh, blood damage, or maybe even just as simple as uh, negligence, not taking care of it, mold and all that starts coming in and it, they just toss it away. And whenever that I come across uh, to request all of these images, they say, oh, no, no, we already uh, burn it. Yeah, we already burn it, but apparently they didn't. They just like uh, kept it away or they just toss it away. Oh, sorry, uh, oh, flood, yeah, a flood. There flood, was, flood. was floods, uh, yeah. The big flood in 2014. Yeah. <laughs> 2014. That one uh, was a big miss uh, on my side, uh, particularly from Kelantan. There was this uh, studio from uh, Mido Studio. Mm -hmm. They toss out, like, literally, I think, probably half a ton of oh, yeah. glass plate negative. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, like, my, uh, my face palm. I mean, it's a missed opportunity. I uh, would imagine, like, uh, the things that we probably find would be, like, much more significant. I mean, like, we keep on losing uh, visual images of the past. I mean, like, Alex has his own uh, manner uh, of collection. For me, I enjoy the travel to talk to the uh, photo studio owners to understand. And most of the time, it's as simple as like, hey, uh, can you take a passport photo of me? Or can I make a photocopy of this? Most of the photo studios have photocopy machines. You got to like entice them. It's not like randomly go into photo studio tell me the story of your life. It doesn't work that way. You got to engage them. Say, uh, boleh ambil passport foto saya tak? And then, dah lama buat kerja ni. And it becomes as a, a more on a proximity trust. It's not easy because I'm not a Chinese. Majority of the photo studio owners are Chinese lot. And there was even one case where there's this lady, I, I could swear to you, I went to that studio like four times. She keeps on changing her name four times. <laughs> and I was wondering as well so I asked the doctor he said what's up with that he said like, why each time I datang why auntie itu selalu tukar nama because auntie itu kata is like, she never left the studio since the Japanese era oh. and she is a fantastic photo retoucher a colorist as well so I asked why most likely uh, the doctor whispered to me she think the police is, is out to get her 
<laughs> so I, okay lah, she's a communist mind, but <laughs> so I did way donkey years ago. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's all those little things I enjoy the most. If I get anything from studio material, uh, panoramic image, I think from Mido, I, I just pass it to Alex, and it, it it's just um Alex has his own way in collection. For me, I I collect experience of okay. meeting up with these people. Uh, of course, there's not many left. There, there is not many left. I mean, like the simplest way in detecting these places is uh, follow the river. That's kind of odd because it's, uh, sometimes you go to all these small little pekan, pekan kecil sana sini in Pahang, uh, in uh, the northern side in Kedah, in Perak, Perlis. They uh, most of these photo studios is always somewhat nearby the river. Kind of odd bit like that or train uh, railway station. Yeah, only these two. I find it it's almost like they at least um, at the very most one kilometer away. But most of it is already gone, shifted when your good self, Simon, and uh, Rahel called me up to say there's there's an opportunity to do an exhibition in regards to photo history. Of course, I like I like Alex had mentioned. I I cut out him. I think up to a point that he <laughs> gave in. I get the post like we in a polite way. <laughs> Of course, it's like almost a cursed thing when we say that the title of this exhibition, Bayangnya Timbul Tenggelam, Tenggelam Terus with the COVID-19 thing. <laughs> it's like a curse or something like that. It's like, or maybe it's just an opportunity to step back and giving us a breathing time to properly write this about this uh, exhibition. Because photography is, is an important opportunity for us to communicate with people. And... The thing is, it's like there's only so much limitation one could get from looking at things virtually, and one experiencing it uh, in person. Uh, the materiality of uh, how photography was. People can go so much like oh, IG, Instagram, and all that, but when it becomes as a silver-based images in the past, it's an heirloom of our previous visual life, our ancestor, uh, our uh, our history, heirlooms from history. So my yeah. sense is this collection is built up through a conversation, right? Uh, but where do you hope to take this collection? And I think it's at the scale and the size and the range and the diversity and the kind of obsession that is bigger than just a personal hobby. <laughs> it is bigger. I mean, like where, our, na- where, our, where? our neighboring country like Thailand and so forth has its own world memory. I think the Royal Negative Collection I saw the exhibition in, in Thailand, in Bangkok, I think about a couple of years. What they did was they uh, reprint yeah. those negatives. Yeah. It was horrendous of an experience. They make it larger. The original is about yay big. But they make it like big poster, this uh, glass plate negative uh, exhibition. I was really psyched up. I went to Bangkok to, to have a look at it. And apparently they print, they did a scan and reprint reprint and the reprint isn't any good either uh, you can see pixelation and all that and there is no soul in it, it you just don't feel it uh, the imperfections of of all this material is not there they, they touch it up the subject matter from the bangkok collection or the glass plate negative speaks about how the culture was like in the past because the royal families in thailand are obsessed about photography, hence it becomes uh, a known thing. They take ev- images of everything. So it became as a, as a trade. And for us, because there is no opportunity of a royal family, with the exception of, I think, uh, Sultan Ismail, yeah. but there's a certain limit to it as well. Alex's collection is consistent of many image makers, many photo studios. And collectively, it's a certain uh, period of time as well, where photography is a, an image object. So what we have, I mean, what Alex has, actually, is, um, I would say, in my own personal opinion, is a great find. Is there a reason for you to po- uh, start your collection around the early 20th century? The proliferation of Chinese and japanese owned photo studios. Why didn't you start your collection, say, earlier with the 19th century? I think I, when I started to collect, I decided it has to be just black and white. I wasn't interested in so much of the color. Okay. Uh, color came in about 1972 plus 1975. So I, I, I was more looking into 
whatever that was available. And let's say there were a lot more initial stage were probably photographs of the 60s, 70s. And then later on over the years start to come in a lot more older ones. Eh? I, I don't know, it's, it's like a different uh, uh, phase of it. Yeah. So right now, for example, for the past two, three years, I hardly collect any more of 60s, 70s, or 50 studio. I go more for the much, much right. earlier ones. Yeah? Um, and uh, the reason for that, I think I have quite a bit of it. And then also, uh, they're a bit common, really. So I, I, unless it's something very special, like the posing is different, or the, the, you know, the hairdo is different kind of thing, or the, the dressing kind of thing. But I still continue to collect hand colored ones. I don't know why, because I think the hand colored ones are a bit rare and because a studio, they don't really make a lot of hand colored ones because time consuming and expensive as well kind of thing. So oh, when I started, actually initial stage was just photograph. Later on, I discovered there were a lot of um, catalogs, envelopes, you know, the, 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 the dark room stuff, uh, the trays and things like that. As you say, so this uh, studio, they were actually closing down and they were all thrown away. All this. So I started to buy them as well. Came in the, um, the studio as well. Uh, you buy up the studio or? I buy up, uh, I literally I buy up whatever I can, again, lights. For example, the, the this old studio lights, old studio camera, the, the furniture like the chairs and the trays, uh, signboards, you know, like I, I just posted one, I just yeah. picked up today, yeah, in the Gumball okay. studio. And then uh, came the, the studio stuff, because at the end of the day, I think I, I collect, it's just, I think it's not, not photograph, because it's related, yeah, books. I think I've got hundreds of books on photography, all about kind of, but at the end of the day, I think it's so, uh, mine, like, as you say, it's, it's a family of it, just not the, just not the, the what else is produced is the, the, the dark room, the, 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 the studio, they're all interlinked, these three things that makes the, the studio, I mean, makes the photograph. Because I think a lot of people uh, will collect photographs, they don't go and collect all these envelopes as you can see, you know, or, or other things like, uh, because I was very interested that whatever that I can collect from studios, in Malaysia or Malaya, because I, I'm more interested in the local. I'm not so interested about outside uh, Malaysia. I mean, the US kind of thing. But I'm also, what can I find from all these studios that have been closing? One, two, three closing. I want the identity, yeah, because they, they all have their own. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what I'm interested in. So uh, to be honest, I think there's only very few left old studio. Azri has seen some. I'm still eyeing one from Sandakan, one from uh, Kuantan that I know of. Uh, then, is that the oldest? The one in Kuantan? Sanchu, yeah. Sanchu, I think, uh, yeah, um, is probably yeah, one of the oldest. oldest. If that one probably is still standing. Uh, Penang, I don't think there are any more. They are all gone. I know, I know of Sandak, uh, Sandakan, that's one in oh, Sabah. Okay. There's two. Um, Sandakan, ooh, I can't remember. Uh, it's, it's just closed. I see last one actually just closed. I managed to get in touch with this old man. So I'm still trying very hard to get in touch with his nephew. Uh, he said they have not decided what they do, do with all the old for. I think Azriel saw that I have posted the boxes and boxes of negative. You know, I think Azriel will re remember what I'm talking about. Still, I'm trying to very hard. I really make contact to tell them, don't burn anything, don't throw anything, anything you don't want, please keep it. Let me know after the you know, MCO is over, I'll make a trip kind of thing. So that has good flow. The, the Kuantan one is still standing. Uh, Mr. Chu, uh, I'm in touch with him. He has shown me some interesting stuff, some very old and large kind of thing, but he, yeah, yeah. But I already bought off most of his stuff. <laughs> he time I go to Kuantan, he said, you know, he's just to this. You know, so one, but yeah. But there's two in, um, there's uh, two in Tampin. Uh, pretty old studio as well. I'm not sure Azrael has it. But uh, mm -hmm. old China man. Mm -hmm. uh, one is called Silver Light and the other one is something I can't remember. 
yeah, uh, still still eyeing, but a bit. I, I don't know. But of course, KL, I think they are all gone except for that one Park Thai. Yeah, Park Thai has moved as well. Yeah, other than that, there's no more old studios. Yeah, Penang, no, nope, no, nope. they they're all gone. Xiao Xiong, I think, is one of the last standing one. It's gone. Um, yeah, Ipo is the all. Yeah, Ipo is gone. They all converted to modern ones. Yeah. So it's really in the smaller towns, lah. Yeah, the Kuala Kangsa one, I've gone, I've already taken, taken a lot of stuff from him. Uh, yeah. Do you have the, uh, a vision for this collection? I mean, what's your ultimate goal? I have this dream. <laughs> well, when I retire, I mean, now I'm 62, yeah. When the time comes, I have to retire that I will love to have this whole collection of mine. Um, curated in my own way, the way that I was wanted it to be with the, all the photographs, all the dark room stuff, and all the studio stuff that I were to take it at an exhibition. Of course, the book will come with it, probably done or written or researched in my own way and accounting, you know, and then I'll get someone to where uh, you guys write more the historical part of it, I would say. So yeah, I think uh, that that is what the dream that I have. Of course, I always toy this idea, which uh, my wife thinks I am just silly. That well, not not so much a museum. I don't think the museum people is like someone who will want to have a cafe. That you know, instead of you know, nowadays you got a oh, cafe. People putting all the old old stuff, right? Hanging all the vintage kind of thing. So this is just photography that I will you know change the, the, the there's so much photograph you can see the wall you can go to, uh, in a, there's a dark room then there's a studio there and backdrop you know and when you finish eating go and take a picture i visited both the camera museum in penang i think one is already gone the other one i'm not sure is still standing so that that was probably something that you know i'm never dream dream of but definitely seriously i think this coming exhibition that you guys are doing uh, with me is a good start uh, of it, but uh, I, I'm still collecting. So I think uh, down the road, another five, six years, I hopefully I can buy up everything by then. <laughs> <laughs> buy up, have everything, and have this massive collection. Besides Azriel uh, annoying you every day about starting to show your work, why do you feel like this is the right time to start sharing? Azriel and me, we meet very regularly for, for other things. You say, Alex, you know, uh, I can do a you know, someone can do a PhD on this is of this your whole collection. I think I can say again, I think I don't think I have enough yet. <laughs> because I think still a lot of things still missing. Uh in, in it, no? So yeah. Because I read up a lot of the history of photography, like you know, uh, the British accounting, the, the Royal Journal accounting. So uh, there's still some missing link. So I, I need to pluck those missing part. And then when I ready and do this massive exhibition, I say like, nothing is missing. Everything is there, which I think is just not possible. Obviously to be really, I think this is impossible. That attempt is it's almost like chasing a red herring right there. I mean, like to chase after, sometimes the rarity of things is like the uh, the early early era of photography, like albumin print, salt print, those yeah. are difficult. Uh, albumin print, yes. I mean, I got some albumin. Salt some, print, I think some, probably uh, some are, but have to be mindful yeah. as well. Those things can be reproduced modern uh, in modern time yeah. to get the, uh, the certified crew uh, to the time, the eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies. Those are. Not easy. Yeah, back to recently, I think I posted, I, I think Fan Chon commented. Recently, I just posted on my Facebook of this old lady with a head cut and paste mm. and all the dark room. To me, it's like, yeah. wow, that is something different because it's really bad dark, dark room work. But it's, you know, probably the lady is really dead. But that, that for me, it's important piece. Now, just, just to make all of you, I've just acquired the Kuda. You know, the studio Kuda, I've got a Vespa, I've got a bicycle and a car coming. So that, 
Yeah, that right. you know the studio, the, you know the studio. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought all. The oh, I managed to wow. buy it. Yeah, wow. so I just I I, I got to pick it up. I yeah I got to pick it up. I yeah, thought so. <laughs> yeah, that 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 will complete because this four thing is important. I really got the background. Very, very, very yeah, important. Yeah, because. This this fall important. I'm still looking for the puppy, you know, the puppy. Yes, the dog. <laughs> the dog. Yeah, the dog. That would be that, that that that's. I'm still to be honest. I think that's going to be a bit difficult, but I'm trying very hard. You mean but the porcelain, the, the porcelain yeah, dog, yeah, the isn't porcelain it? dog. Yeah, I already got the horse. I already got the Vespa. I already got a car. I already got a bike. Yeah, the old bike kind of thing. So just you know, crazy. Uh, yeah, different place. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that that will complete. So I'm happy with that. Photos, they're almost there. Well, yeah. So, I, because I, I already got the speed tone, you know, the chair or the counter. That 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 is easy to get. Yeah, because I don't want someone. I mean, Simon, uh, Fanchon, and as you, and I have. Hey, you know, those days people used to have the car. You don't have a car. You only got a horse, and you only got a bike. <laughs> Something is missing. No, no, all four. <laughs> The four must appear. Yeah, that's it. So nobody's gonna say I don't want to. I can sound sound like very self centered or but I don't know someone who come to the experience say, oh no, I remember my grandmother has got something better than this. My but I got this, this, this. <laughs> uh, I try. <tried. laughs> I you know in my side, but you know, I got I, like, almost everything there because the subject changes fair enough, you know. But the the style of it, the posing, the print. Uh, even the photograph, some of the photograph, the design, as you can see something, the shape, oval shape come with all the pattern. I try to have as many as possible because I don't understand say, hey, you know, I remember my great grand uncle, similar like that, but this is better. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but this is me. Yeah. You know? Can can I ask you, because yeah. uh, from what you describe your kind of your dream, uh, your ultimate dream of um, putting uh, an exhibition <clears throat> in a cafe because you, you want to make it like a friendlier environment that is not intimidating like most of the museum can be sometimes. So uh, to you, photography is, is a way to spread joy and you want to make it that way. Is that, is that how you see photography and the way you want to share? I want it to be shared a large to people like you come to this place, not a museum, yeah? You don't have to pay money. You come and get a drink, work out, and you can see all this thing there. You can enjoy it. Everything is there. And I want it to be shared. Everybody can see it. That's my, my ultimate kind of thing. I don't care about, you know, whether it's, for, it's from me. For me, it's, it's photography. I always think that I'm not important, but I'm just a collector. Because I had to pass on when the time comes, you know, this massive stuff has to pass on to somebody, you know, where, where, when the time comes, another 10 years or 50 or what. So as long as I get to share it, I, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy with it. Do yeah. you think the younger generation can relate to the photo studio, given that they, they grew up in a time of Instagram and smartphones and technology of photography? Yo. Do you think that it's still resonant with them? And I think they will be shocked and curious because right. the photographs are important because with the photograph that I actually think you can see all the backdrop. Wow. I mean, it used to be like that. You know, my great granddad or you mean this is it? Wow. Yeah, I, I think they, they will. Why are I saying this? I go to most flea market when they have the collectors every now and then few months. I would say the big one as in M comma. When I go around, I hang around with all my so-called this friend, and I see young people actually walk around and they were, the mother will kind of say, your, your, your grandma used to be your granddad. And the kid will say, wow, that's cool. I've not seen this before. You mean this speed tune, what do you do with it? You mean you pee in it? Fuck. You mean you spit in it? Oh, disgusting, but kind of thing. So I think the young people, a lot of them, you know, will connect the moment that they see something like that. And I think yeah. people in KL especially, uh, the KL, the big city one, will, will appreciate a lot, lot more. Yeah. KL, uh, the city has grown so much. A lot of people who are working in KL probably come from a smaller town, right? Mm. And when they moved out, probably all this is already, they, they don't pay attention to it. And, you know, they finish their secondary school, they come out, and then suddenly, and then they're working now, and these things come back and appear to them. Oh, I remember, you know, oh, I'm from Tanjung Malim, I'm from Pekan, or whatever kind of thing. 
yeah, I remember that I, I used to sit on one of these pods. I mean, this is what it is. Yeah, I think it will. Penang, I think they will. Because I'm talking to a lot of these friends of mine who are runners. They come from all other towns. They always tell me and always ask them. Penang is, uh, I always uh, ask a few of these people that, uh, I say, why, why don't the Penang flea market uh, flourish? I say, no, they just don't have the power, don't have the purchasing power. And people there they say, ah, I grew up with it, I know big deal. But the city, yes, definitely. KL is still the, the place, yeah. Would kids nowadays be interested in this? I, I believe so, they would. I gave one primary example. I showed one of the uh, students, the, the girl type. Uh, bit that I have, uh, which is the first degree type that I purchased, uh, which is John Mayer piece. And I don't know if uh, you guys seen this, but uh, it's a beautiful piece. And you can see it, it's hand tinted and all that. And they don't know how to interact with it properly. So yeah, what they did was, they, they, they tried to pinch as if it can zoom in. It's a, it's a, <laughs> they tried to zoom in. <laughs> so it's like they don't, can't figure it out how to work with it. <laughs> Just enjoy looking at it, and it's wait, wait, it's, it's so wonderful. And Alex, I think you're gonna love this because this is hand tinted. Wow! Yeah, yeah. I was gonna hand tinted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rosy pink, and this is by John Mayer. John Mayer oh, is right. one of the uh, he's he's up there uh, in as a the girl type is. Um, but they were laughing because they said, they said you really, you can't, you can't zoom in or swipe or whatnot. No, it does that. <laughs> it just stays there. Um, it, it is an image object. That's how, how I repeated mentioned before. And um, they will be uh, interested in it because it will come into a full circle. Uh, image making is part of a rigor of a, uh, an interactivity approach to it. So will they learn about it? I, I suspect they will. Um, now that we are uh, at an age where everything they see, uh, knowledge is virtually available, but it can be experiential as well. And I believe this will be a, one, a wonderful experiential thing. Probably it's a good thing that we, we see Alex's work like this, because Alex, I'm sure you haven't seen it being displayed. No. Haven't uh, worked through. I mean, you, you, see it, you see it one by one. Or several pieces at, in a single time, but to see it as a like like mm. whole haul of it, and then this original piece. I mean, and these are I, original I, I, pieces. Yeah, and, and non, I, non, non retro. You walk through yeah, it. Non I, I, yeah, non I'm, I'm I'm so, yeah. in a way, quite envy of Chito that he has the opportunity to be there. Mm. Yeah, I I hope like this is the beginning of it of uh, Alex's work uh, collection or journey towards something greater, uh, towards what is that he desired to be like this totality of completeness. I think you'll never be complete, Alex. You'll <laughs> never finish this, which is a good thing, this kind of obsession. Um, I guess it's like, a, um, I, I think both of us grew up being black and white, being in a dark room, uh, mm. to, in a sense that try to achieve the perfect image, which is like next to impossible until all your money is spent. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we've been grilled by uh, whoever taught us black and white photography. It's like a, nothing is ever uh, perfect on the first get go. So this is the first exhibition of, of it, and certainly, I, I believe it won't be the last. It cannot yep. be the last. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure even the next exhibition that after this is going to surprise us even more. Mm to see what kind of things being uh, curated. Do you keep in touch with other collectors? Is there a collecting mm -hmm. community? There are other collectors out there that you're in conversation with. Yeah, I, I know of, there's another friend who collects old Nyonya stuff, but he, he has some old Nyonya photos. I have not really seen this collection. There's one more guy in Penang, this Apec collects some old photo, but more the Nyonya kind of thing. Yeah. There are a few of them, but, um, as far as on, on the Facebook, which I, 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 I mean, local people who have gone on to Facebook, actually, I have not seen anybody so consistently has as much of photographs as me. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't post, I don't know, they don't want to share. Mm -hmm. I would say I will give probably another year or two. Probably that's, that's about it. All these old photographs, they either won't, won't appear unless someone, 
a collector has it and start to sell it or kind of thing. Otherwise, I, I don't think it will a lot more left behind to be collected if, mm. if they are not, not all bought by me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, trust me. It's like I go to most of the state except for Joho. They know I like. <laughs> <laughs> Every pasar karat imaginable. <laughs> so there you go. Oh, Alex. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so some of them thought I was competing with you. <laughs> so I was looking for him. For How do you get him. around? Did you drive? Well, we drive on our own. I, whenever I balik kampung or whatnot. Oh. Yeah, uh, Alex traveled for, for his work, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, so it accommodates towards that. So yeah, if that for me it's just out of random if I see like old photo studio or maybe a good opportunity coincidence with Hari um, was it uh, Pasakara right? So <laughs> so that's where I would like drop in and see what what do they have. So yeah, I mean literally everybody knows Alex. I think uh, every Pasakara that <laughs> that you mentioned Alex more. Oh yeah, that that chap working in KL in a kedai apa kedai camera right? <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's him. So you start name dropping, right? This is that literally they would bring a smile to their face. Huh? <laughs> I think he's been buying quite a lot from them. <laughs> oh, that should be the title of the next show. Everybody knows Alex. <laughs> Everybody knows Alex. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a team. It's a teamwork for me. I I think mm. this this show coming up. Uh, it's just I'm just. Part of it, I think without you guys, Azrael, you, Simon, Chita, everybody, I, I don't think this show will come out. Because uh, frankly, if, you are, if, if Azrael won't poke me and you guys won't you share, I, I don't think show, this show will, will, will come out at all. Frankly speaking, probably another five, six years, maybe. <laughs> but mm. Otherwise, you won't. I'll be still going, collecting, collecting, collecting. It's a beginning. I mean, like, it yeah. may not be as perfect as how one yeah. would hope or one would, Alex would, would hope. But... I think it's uh uh it's it's a momentum. It's like a like a, a snowball starting from up here. It goes bigger and bigger. It's like a book, right? Edition one, two, update. Right, right. I mean, like there's uh, there's versions things, yeah. and updates and better yeah. better things come into the collection. Better the thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like now Alex uh, not only talk about the images. I think uh, what interests as well is his passion to complete even like the studio look, not look the inventory. I think. Uh, what makes a uh, image making as well? So that one is certainly the camera, the uh, the tools, the utilities, the contraption, the accessories, the lighting, the backdrops. Even like as much as we were really excited when 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 I heard Alex say, "Oh yeah, I got the horse, the car, the motorcycle, probably uh, a goose. Probably that's the next one, next to a level of difficulty, rabbit, porcelain rabbit, and all that." No, All puppy sorts of will, will be difficult. Yeah. Puppy is difficult. Puppy, that, yeah. Mm. So yeah. Um, but it will be there. It will. It will yeah. arrive somewhere. I think I have some idea where where these mm. things may be. Provided that if it's still in business, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, like it was being mentioned early on, it, it will become greater as we go along. That's yep. that's the whole the whole idea mm-hmm. on me helping you on this one, Alex. Kena mula juga. You got to start. Yeah, girl, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got to start. And here here's a like like a like a push start and and I'm I, I think I believe like everybody's so so eager and quite happy. Hanton mm. and his, his collection he complete his uh, Eva collection. And then uh, Simon Probably like a non-stop take, snapping photo, even though I I ping tepat lah, kena pilih gambar, right? <laughs> so like, in between, but I'm I'm glad to see everybody's happy. Even Rahel, uh, is also I think he she's quite pleased when when it was being presented over at Ilham. Uh, 